Um, we're going to move forward and talk about the judiciary. This is the federal court system. In 2010, Barack Obama uh, nominated the former Solicitor General Elena Kagan, and this is a picture of her, to the Supreme Court, and that brought the number of women justices to three. So Kagan's nomination was approved by the Senate. Remember, the Senate has to approve all presidential nominations and was sworn in by Chief Justice John Roberts there showing you uh, his photo on the right. So that's Justice Kagan on the left and Justice Roberts on the right. Okay, so we're going to talk about in terms of the objectives of what we want to uh, achieve here um, in part one, and again this part one will be broken down into A and B. We're going to talk about the foundation of the judiciary. We're going to talk about what types of cases does the federal judiciary hear and what types of courts exist. And there's going to be a lot of other terms we're going to throw out there as well as provide a structure of the system. How do cases flow through the federal court system? Then we're going to talk about how do cases reach the Supreme Court. Um, and then when we get to part two, we'll talk about judicial decision making. How is it that judges on the federal bench decide cases? What are the factors that influence their decision making? And then what about the politics of the federal judiciary? What types of political maneuvering occur when it comes to Democrats and Republicans when, it, when the issue of appointing federal judges comes into play? All right. Um, I don't think this slide is on the PDFs that you downloaded, but um, one of the founding fathers um, uh, described the judicial branch as the least dangerous branch of the government. And you'll find the information about the creation of the judiciary in Article 3 of the Constitution. And here is what the Constitution says. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So in that first section, we see that the Constitution only provides for one court. That's our U.S. Supreme Court. All of the other courts are created by Congress. And then it says, the judges both of the Supreme and inferior courts shall hold their offices during good behavior and, sh and shall, at stated times, receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. Okay. So again, the Founding Fathers, led by Alexander Hamilton, believed that the, judiciary, ju that the judiciary would prove to be the weakest of the three branches of government, and that's why they called it the least dangerous branch. In fact, the judicial branch seemed so inconsequential at the time that when the young national government made its move to Washington, D.C. in 1800, Congress really forgot to include any space to actually house the justices of the Supreme Court. So there wasn't even a court, a physical space provided for them. But we know now that the role of the courts, particularly the Supreme Court, is very much different, significantly so different from that envisioned by the Founding Fathers. In fact, this least dangerous branch is now perceived by many as having too much power. So that leads to the question of, does the judiciary have too much power today, and how is the judicial branch political? And those are the two kinds of questions that over the course of the next couple of lectures uh, you should be able to kind of think about um, a as we move forward. All right, well let's just take apart this can uh, constitutional foundation of the court. Okay? The detailed notes that ja uh, James Madison took at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia made it clear that the framers devoted little time to writing Article Three of the Constitution. They debated on even the need for any federal courts below the Supreme Court. So again, if we take apart what the Constitution provides, Article Two of the Con I'm sorry, Article Three of the Constitution established one Supreme Court and left to the Congress to decide the structure of the different courts and the number of justices on the Supreme Court. So the Constitution stipulates that federal judges should hold their offices during good behavior. This means it's interpreted to mean a life term. So federal judges, whether you're talking about on the Supreme Court or all the other federal courts that exist, all those judges are appointed 
for life. And this is why it's so political, because presidents know that when they nominate federal judges, those judges are going to remain on the bench for 10, 15, 20, even 30 years or more after the president is no longer in office. So this is really their, le their legacy of being able to nominate federal judges that have a similar viewpoint as they do, and that, and that influence is going to last for many, many years. All right, judges cannot be removed from office for any reason other than the fact that they've broken the law. So the President, Congress can't get rid of judges because they don't like what their decisions are. Now this is the federal judiciary. This is very different than the Texas judiciary, which we'll talk about next, uh, next week. Okay. So again, the judges are appointed by the President. They're confirmed by Congress. They have an appointment for life. They can hold that job until they die, but many retire. And they can only be removed from office through the impeachment process if they have seen to be broken or, or seem to have broken a particular piece of legislation. And they're not going to have their salaries decreased over time, so they can't get a pay cut. All right, let's talk a little bit about jurisdiction. And I think these are the slides that then pick up on what I have on the PDF. What do we mean by jurisdiction? Jurisdiction really talks about who has the authority to first hear a case. So we think a lot about the shows we see on TV like Law and Order, CSI, or any other um, you know, procedural cop show. Most of those cases wind up in a state court and they go to trial to see if a person is innocent or guilty. That first court that has the authority to hear the case that court has what is called original jurisdiction. Okay. If you lose that court case and you want to appeal, then the next court has what is called appellate jurisdiction. And that's the authority of a court to hear a case based on an appeal, um, given the fact that the lower court has made a decision. Okay. So Article 3 of the Constitution specifies the judicial power of the Supreme Court, including what kind of original jurisdiction the Supreme Court has and what kind of an appellate jurisdiction the Supreme Court has. So original jurisdiction, again, refers to which court hears a case first, which is usually in a trial, and these are the courts that determine the facts about a case. So you might want to add that on your notes under original jurisdiction. The first place where the case is heard, that establishes the facts. The appellate jurisdiction refers again to the right to hear a case brought before court on appeal from the lower courts. The key here is that these courts do not review the factual record, only the legal issue involved. So you can't appeal simply because you don't like the decision. You have to appeal based on some sort of legal issue that occurred at the lower court. And that's why you hear lawyers always objecting to things. So if you don't object to some procedure at the lower court, you have no grounds for appeal during your uh, appellate uh, session. So before any court can actually hear a case, it must be demonstrated that they have jurisdiction or the authority to hear and decide the issues in that case. So if we look at where federal courts are, what you have is this kind of tiered system. The Supreme Court is at the top. It is the U.S. Supreme Court. So they have some original jurisdiction, and I get, I'll get to the types of cases that they hear momentarily, but most of the cases that are brought before the Supreme Court are brought to them by appeal. So the Supreme Court has both original and appellate jurisdiction. You're going to want to write that down. The Supreme Court has both original and appellate jurisdiction. The appellate courts, which are spread out across the United States, there's 12 regional courts, as you can see here. We are, the state of Texas is in the fifth regional appellate district. Appellate courts only have appellate jurisdiction. You can't hold a trial for the first time at the appellate court. Trial courts, also known as U.S. District Courts, are federal trial courts scattered around the United States. 
It also includes some bankruptcy courts as well as Court of International Trade and the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. But we're going to concentrate on these district courts. So if you're a Texas resident but you, cr you um, commit a federal crime or are accused of committing a federal crime, you're going to go to federal district court. Okay, there's several of them here in the state of Texas, and so you'd be in a federal court in Houston. If you lose your case and you have grounds for an appeal, you would appeal that case to the 5th District Courts of Appeals, and it's in New Orleans. Okay. You lose that case and you want to appeal and have grounds, then you would appeal it to the U.S. Supreme Court. So trials start down here in the district courts in the federal system. The appeals go to the U.S. Courts of Appeals, and from there they go to the U.S. Supreme Court. There's some other federal courts that are in existence, so there's some military courts, of course. We have a Court of Veterans' Appeals, the U.S. Tax Court, and some other agencies and boards at the federal system. Okay. But here's how the federal court system works. Okay. And so we'll talk uh, only about the federal courts today, and then we'll talk about Texas state courts next week. Okay. So how do you know which court has original or appellate jurisdiction? Okay. And again, the jurisdiction of how it is that you wind up in a federal court is controlled by the U.S. Constitution and by federal laws. So jurisdiction is based on the following, and you're going to want to write this down. There's three things. Jurisdiction is conferred or decided based on the following. What's the issues of the case? What type of money or what amount of money is involved? And what's the type of offense? Okay, and so those three things, the issues of the case, the amount of money involved, and the type of offense will decide which court you wind up at. Most will wind up in the trial courts, and there's federal criminal courts, and there's federal civil courts, all right? So let's talk about first do, what types of, of uh, cases does the Supreme Court have original jurisdiction for? That is... What types of case are heard for the very first time at the highest level, the U.S. Supreme Court? So you know it has to be a very special type of case for it to first be heard at the Supreme Court. And so here are the kinds of cases that the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction to hear. Cases that deal with constitutional issues or laws or treaties of the United States. So if a constitutional issue is at stake, the Supreme Court will have original jurisdiction over that. Secondly, any type of admiralty or maritime case goes to the Supreme Court because those are, are either in U.S. waters, not particularly in a state, or they're in international waters. So you're going to deal with anything, crimes or issues happening on the high seas, for example are going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. If the United States is a party to the case, that is, is the United States suing someone or is someone suing the United States, then that is going to be heard originally at the Supreme Court. In addition, there are several types of controversies that the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction over because they would be a conflict of interest to be held in a state court. So controversies between a state and a citizens of another state. So if the citizens of Texas, for whatever reason, wants to sue the state of Oklahoma, that court, case, that court case is going to be held at the Supreme Court. If two or more states are involved in a controversy, if citizens of different states, or if a state and a, or citizens of a state and some foreign entity is being um, sued or involved in the case. And all those cases are going to be heard originally at the Supreme Court. And then lastly, if there's any ambassadors from other countries in the United States and they get accused of a crime and are actually brought to trial, the Supreme Court would hear that case first. All right, so this is a list of the types of cases that the Supreme Court would have original jurisdiction over. All other cases are going to start in the federal trial court, go through that process. If an appeal is going to be made, it would then go to the U.S. Courts of Appeals, and then after that, if another appeal would be made, then it would go to the U.S. Supreme Court. All right, so how did we get all these courts? 
A very important piece of legislation is the Judiciary Act of 1789. Remember, the Constitution specified that only court that they would create would be the Supreme Court, but Congress was left to fill in the, uh, fill in the blanks, and so this is what they did. They created the federal court system. And Congress spent nearly the entire last half of its very first session deliberating the various provisions of this act that were going to be needed in order to form and, uh, and, and give substance to the federal judiciary. So when the Congress adopted the Judiciary Act of 1789, it really created a tiered system. It created, obviously, two tiers underneath the Supreme Court. You have the appellate, and you have the district courts. And so what you have is a three-tiered system. Okay. And there's going to be at least one federal district court in each state. Okay. The act also stated that the Supreme Court would consist of five associate justices and one Supreme Court um, 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 head judge. So there's going to be a, a total of six. That number has evolved over time and has since been amended. So for example, in 1807, it was increased by one to seven because they found out that when you have six judges, you're never going to be able to break a tie. In 1837, two more were added for a total of nine. In 1863, now remember this is during the Civil War, another justice was added to make it a total of ten during the war but obviously they had the same problem with an even number. So it was changed back to nine after the Civil War in 1869, where it has stayed since then in spite of the efforts of Franklin Roosevelt. From your history days, you probably remember that he tried to pack the court in order to try and make sure that his New Deal legislation was not going to be found unconstitutional. He wanted to add, 15, um, add more to have 15 judges. This, of course, would allow him to appoint six new justices and change the court in his favor, but Congress um, thought that was pretty fishy and failed to support his court packing plan. Nonetheless, we now have nine Supreme Court justices, all right, and that number has stayed um, since 1869. The other thing that the Judiciary Act did was create these circuit or appellate, or appellate courts. So there's a lot of terms being thrown out here, so you need to make sure you can match them up. District and trial courts mean the same thing. Those are the cases, the courts that hear the, the original jurisdiction. Circuit and appellate mean the same thing. Okay. So the Judiciary Act created three circuit or appellate courts. You had the eastern, which is here in yellow. You had the middle circuit, which is in blue. And you had the southern circuit which is in red in this map, of the three circuits created by the Judiciary Act of 1789. And each one of these circuits were composed of two of the Supreme Court justices and one district court justice, and they really literally rode the circuit to hold court throughout the territory. So for the first hundred years of the Supreme Court's history, the requirement that the justice ride circuit for extended periods of the year made the job very arduous and unappealing. So literally, you would have Supreme Court justices and some other district judges riding around on their horses going through all this different territory to hear cases on appeal, and this is why they're called circuit. The judges literally rode through the circuit of their territory. Okay. The circuit court duties created, obviously, problems for the court. Few good lawyers were willing to accept the nomination to this high court, the Supreme Court, because of the duties involved in this particular arduous uh, process of riding the circuits. Today we have 12 different circuits. I have a map of that that I'll show you later. And obviously we no longer have Supreme Court justices riding around or flying around the United States to hear courses, uh, cases on appeal. Another important element that happened early on, and you should be familiar with this case, we've talked about it before, is the Marbury v. Madison case, which gives us the issue of judicial review. Okay. Um, and judicial review means that the Supreme Court has elevated itself into a major law-making body. Okay. And many people believe that the power of judicial review over congressional acts, which was established in Marbury v. Madison, 
is something of a usurpation of power. And the fact that originally the judges or the courts weren't deemed by the Founding Fathers to be creating legislation. But on the other hand, the Supreme Court could argue that they have the power to review state legislation because of the Supremacy Clause, which declares the laws of the United States the supreme law of the land. And the Judiciary Act that I just spoke of, of 1789, explicitly grants the United States Supreme Court the power to reverse state uh, constitution and laws when they're in clear conflict of the U.S. Constitution and federal laws. So if you remember the Marbury v. Madison case, that the incoming Jefferson administration denied the appointment of William Marbury as Justice of the Peace for the District of Columbia. So he, <clears throat> he sued for his post, arguing that the courts interpret law and that, that the Constitution is a form of law, and the Supreme Court can indeed interpret the Constitution. So this is G Chief Justice John Marshall, and his court established the power of judicial review, which is the power of the Supreme Court to overturn acts of the president when they deem that act to be unconstitutional. So the public has accepted the Supreme Court's ability to review acts of Congress or acts of the president, even though this was done slowly. On only two occasions before the Civil War did the uh, Supreme Court actually overturn acts of either the Congress or the President. One was here in Mab M M uh, Marbury v. Madison, and the other was in the Dred Scott case that we talked about before, which talked about overturning some of the issues of the Missouri Compromise. Okay. So this again is the landmark case that helped define the powers of the court. So when you hear about Marbury v. Madison, it's not so much that you should remember the, the minute details of the case, but what does the overall case imply? And the overall case implies that the Supreme Court has the power of judicial review, that they can review acts of Congress, acts of um, the state, acts of the president, anyone acting, carrying out law, they can decide whether or not those laws are unconstitutional, and that's called um, judicial review. When it comes to dealing with judicial review and presidential power, however, the courts have been very hesitant to really judge presidential authority, particularly in times of war. So we know that there was imprisonment of Japanese Americans in World War II uh, in internment camps, and they're very deferential to handling of enemy combatants today. Um, as we know when it comes to the issue of those people being held in Guantanamo Bay. And this is just a protest that was held before the Supreme Court in support of those prisoners who they believe should be given rights that the rest of us have through the U.S. court system. Congress can intervene on behalf of those individuals to try and make it a law to have those individuals be given certain rights, but have not yet done that to date. All right. Let's take a break right here and then we'll come back and talk about specific types of cases and where those cases wind up. Okay.